the recording. We'll go ahead and get the process started. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone, for, for joining today. It's really lovely to see everyone. Um, it, it, like Will and I always say, this is one of our favorite work days of the month. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance. My voice sounds terrible. Um, I think I have COVID, so um, I will probably um, just kind of like help out with the intro here and then go on mute and fade into the background a little bit. So um, this is session 19 of Beers with Engineers. Um, and uh, we always have to start off with a safe harbor statement, right? Like a lot of what we're talking about is either net new features or um, things that may potentially be coming out here. So um, take everything that you hear here with a grain of salt. Don't make any stock buying or overall purchase decisions based on any of this information. Um, this is really mostly around us wanting to share and build a community with everybody. Um, so this very, you know, informal agenda, we always kind of run it like this. Um, we will we'll keep it short, sweet, and to the point when it comes to the yakin, and we'll get mostly into the tech stuff. Um, <clears throat> this is a community thing, so always, you know, um, feel free to drop stuff in the chat or ask questions in Q&A or even, you know, jump in and ask questions. This is as much for you guys as it is for us. So let's talk about why we're here. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is the thing that Will and I built um, because we really felt like there's not enough community conversation around the intersection between ServiceNow and cloud native capabilities. Um, and, and in addition to that, there's not really a great forum for folks to talk about um, their experiences and share their experiences in that, um, in that vein. So um, we really built this for that. And we love that so many people continue to show up and support us. And, uh, um, and even we had a great attendance at the live beers with engineers at knowledge this year. So looking forward to doing that one again next year. So <clears throat> who we are. Um, this is normally the part where I introduce the beer that I'm going to drink. I'm not going to drink beer today since I'm, I'm ill. So I'm just going to have water. Um, but I'm Mike Gallagher. I am the manager of the enterprise application platforms team at DRW holdings. Um, I am a old school tech head from way back and, um, have done just about everything in technology that you can possibly imagine. Um, and most recently, um, I am actually helping run um, a team that runs 14 different enterprise platforms for a trading firm out of Chicago. So I'm very much involved in um, technology and how we utilize it in order to drive business and, and make it better. I'm a big fan of Kubernetes, big fan of cloud native technologies, and I love me some automation. So, Will? Hey everybody, Will Hallam. Uh, I'm an advisory solution architect at ServiceNow. I've uh, been also doing technology for a lot of years, currently focusing on IT operations management, in particular automating uh, a lot of things in the cloud native arena. Uh, just really get a lot of satisfaction out of taking something that's cumbersome and repetitive and just taking it out of the hands of people and, and just automating it. My spare time, I like to uh, hang out with my family, play pickup hockey, and video games. And today, since it's October, I will be drinking uh, Samuel Adams Oktoberfest. KubeCon. So, uh, Mike, I think you said you're you're confirmed as well, right? You're going to be yep, yep. out in Chicago. So we will both be out in Chicago for KubeCon, which is November 6th through the 9th. And... Um, there, there isn't, we didn't really get a lot of interest when we solicited for like a formal um, sponsored event. Um, so we'll just kind of be out there. I'll probably be working at a ServiceNow booth. Mike will be just enjoying all of the uh, cloud native innovations as a, as a customer. Um, but if anybody is going to be out there and wants to get together, meet up just informally to chat about whatever um, or mm -hmm. let service now buy you a beer or two feel free to uh hit us up either via discord via our, our email alias um what whatever really quick uh, i apologize chat is disabled um so if you have a question you'll come off mute or throw it in the q a we'll jump into it 
with that, I'm going to go off video and go on mute and let Will handle the rest of this. I guess when I set this up as a webinar, I applied some template that disabled the, the chat. So yeah, so as Mike said, um, I think everybody should be allowed to unmute. Um, yep, looks like Mike's been doing a good job of uh, catching people as they come in. Um, so leverage the, the Q&A panel or feel free to just call, come off mute and, and speak up if you if you would like at any point. Okay, so for this month, I thought it would be cool to look at the uh, new automation that we have around, which basically integrates uh, a capability that's been in Kubernetes for a while, which is the cert manager um, plugin, application, module, whatever you want to call it, and the native ServiceNow certificate inventory and management function. And um, so I hadn't looked at it I, I before um, preparing for this session. I saw some, you know, we got some kind of internal updates that this was coming to the platform and it, it looked pretty cool. Um, but I hadn't really been familiar with it until I thought it'd be a good topic. So um, just these slides mainly just tried to capture my experience with learning about it and setting it up. And hopefully that helps uh, other folks to um, explore it in their own environment. So a few kind of key points about it. Uh, as I mentioned, it leverages the cert manager Kate's application, which is, I forget where it's ranked, but it's pretty high up there in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation um, project activity rating. Uh, you know, so it's it's certainly nothing new under the sun at this point. It's pretty robust. In fact, it's a dependency for one of our other products, the Service Graph Connector for Open Telemetry, that has a dependency on Cert Manager to manage the certificates that are required for the Open Telemetry collector to receive telemetry within your cluster. So, just an example of a, a one of many tools which have a dependency on Cert Manager. So it's very likely that's a facility that's running inside your own Kubernetes clusters today. And so what we kind of use to connect Cert Manager with ServiceNow Certificate Inventory and Management is we created a recipe for creating what's called an external issuer. And it's basically just that's one of the hooks that Cert Manager provides. You can define external issuers in your cluster, which are basically endpoints that Cert Manager can use to request certificates, because that's its function is it requests, renews, revokes certificates within the Kubernetes cluster. So the first thing we did, we created a recipe for uh, which can go into a Kubernetes manifest to spin up a pod, which runs this executable, which on the one hand ingests these certificate requests via cert manager, and then communicates with your ServiceNow instance to plug in uh, certificate request tasks onto the certificate inventory and management functionality. And then we also produce a, a Helm chart as well as a raw YAML manifest, which can be used once you've got that external issuer image to deploy that pod into your Kubernetes clusters and integrate it with uh, the cert manager that's running there. And once you've got those pieces in place, you just submit, you know, a certificate request into your cluster via whatever standard methods are used within your organization. And that can be just a, a manifest which specifies a certificate or CICD pipeline, really, you know, anything that kind of gets that payload into your Kubernetes cluster will then kind of trigger the automation, which then submits a request for a certificate on the ServiceNow side, which can then be automatically fulfilled and it monitors those tasks on a 
configurable interval. When it sees the task is completed, then it pulls a certificate down and installs it into your cluster in the form of a secret. And this works with, from what I could tell, so certificate inventory management has two kind of paths. It's got, um, it's got a manual certificate fulfillment path, which can be used if you are either, you know, not ready to automate or you're just using a CA or, or some CAs, which for which we don't have out of the box automation. Uh, from what I could tell, this only goes, it feeds into the automated workflow. So um, it does require that the CA from which it's requesting a new certificate is one of the ones that we support for automation. Um, that list seems to grow every time we come out with a new store release. The Microsoft CA was not there initially, and now that is in place. That's what I used for my little test setup since as best I can tell, none of the other uh, CAs we support have like a free or a community option. And I didn't feel like uh, trying to expense a bunch of, um, you know, GoDaddy certs or, or whatever. Uh, lessons learned. This is where I usually capture gotchas that I ran into when I deployed my little test setup, um, pitfalls I, I ran into. And really there, there weren't a whole lot. Um, the bulk of the issues I ran into were just due to the fact that I'm not a Windows admin by trade, had not set up a Windows CA before. And so I was setting one up from scratch. And um, the so the, really the only thing that was a bit of a stumbling block was um, for the Windows CA specifically, the subflow, which performs the certificate fulfillment is the the actions that actually do the the heavy lifting are PowerShell actions, and they require uh, what's called CRED SSP, which is a specific kind of a credential authentication um, format protocol within Windows, and that seemed to be a little bit fussier about the trust between my mid server and my CA. Um, so I did have to kind of do a little Windows searching to make sure that all my ducks were in a row for CRED SSP support to work. Uh, there are some pretty good um, diagnostic commands that you can use to kind of validate that that connectivity works. So between that and just like running the flow a bunch of times and observing the, the PowerShell output, I was able to work through that pretty, pretty quickly. And I would think anybody who's uh, a Windows, kind of full-time Windows engineer would probably have a much easier time than, than I did. Uh, the other thing that was just kind of weird was for whatever reason, um, I, it was difficult for me to find the download page that contains the, the collateral that I, that I talked about and that I'll be showing you in a couple minutes, which contain the image recipe and the Helm chart. Um, and I'll kind of illustrate what I mean when I uh, when I do the demo. Um, just going to answer this question of Venafi integration. I'll make a note of that and I'll see, I'll check with the product team and then I'll post the answer when I send the follow-up emails um, with which include the slide deck. I don't know what's on the roadmap um, for new um, CAs off, off the top of my head, but I will take a note and follow up on that. Another point to add there is that <clears throat> if you'd like to, it's worthwhile putting an idea in the idea portal on the community. Um, cause it could potentially get upvoted enough to become an enhancement that will make its way into the product long-term. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, the idea portal, oh, darn it. I'm blanking on whether it's a sub subsite off of the community or off of support at this point, because it's kind of moved around. Um, but I'm going into the demo anyway, so I can take a quick look. I, I think, I think I have the link here.
Huh, yeah, I feel like it's a top level. I thought it was a top level. Yeah. So if you go to ServiceNow Community under Resources, Idea Portal, um, this is kind of our official channel for Voice of the Customer, where if uh, you know there's a piece of functionality that's not there and it would be valuable, a customer can either kind of look in here. and see, so I don't see any requests uh, live on the portal right now for the Venafi uh, CA. So that would be one avenue. I I generally recommend folks check the idea portal and also just make the, um, you know, make, make the fact that you're looking for that known to your account team because they can generally funnel it back as well to the product team. Um, I think critical mass for ideas is 10. If it gets 10 upvotes, then it kind of goes to the next stage of kind of further consideration within the product team. Okay. So in terms of uh, demonstration, I just figured I would show how I put all these pieces together and then just give you a quick demonstration of the functionality in action. So what I meant in my uh, my lessons learned slide when I talked about getting to the download page, I don't know whether I just kept missing it in the docs or, or what it was, but uh, it just was not clear just starting from scratch that the way you get to the download page, which contains the Docker recipe. Um, it also contains a static binary that you can just copy into your, uh, like if you don't want to have the, the Docker image build, download the binary on the fly. You can obtain the binary for the external issuer from this link and then just incorporate it into the directly into the assets directory for your, your image build. And then it's got the Helm chart as well as a raw Kubernetes uh, YAML. But getting to this, this is actually available via a workspace. So if you look at workspaces, certificate management, and then this is Tokyo. And so on Tokyo, the way the download appears is over here. And then just for like, by way of comparison, this is how it looks when you go to that same workspace on Vancouver. So they kind of shifted it around a little bit. And so now there's a downloads, like a downloads tab, I guess I would call it. So just something to be aware of. It took me, you know, half an hour or whatever of kind of poking around to find this. So if I can save somebody else that, that time, then it is goodness. So to put my little setup together, I started by downloading the Docker recipe. And then because I hate, doing manual Docker image builds even one time. Um, what I did was I just created a very simple, I just pulled it down to my Linux machine here, created a very simple build spec so I could build it using AWS code build. Um, this is, you know, this it's super straightforward. And if you just do it manually, it's not the end of the world either. It's basically just doing a Docker build and um, then tagging it and uploading it to my private repo. So that all went pretty smoothly, no major issues. Um, you know, it is kind of a, another build it yourself image. We don't have a publicly serviced image for this at the moment. Again, it's kind of facing those same challenges where it's not, um, it's not a minimized image. It's, it is based on a Linux distro. And because Linux distros are constantly getting flagged with, um, you know, vulnerabilities and, and container images, especially get scrutinized for that. The, the decision was made to kind of bring this to market quickly by just putting that in the hands of the customer. So that if there's a standard Linux distro that you already have, that's minimized and hardened and whatnot, you can just, customize the image to be based on that and bypass a lot of, um, you know, potential security vulnerability response type, um, type of rigor around generating this image. 
So once I had my image uploaded to my private repo, then I moved to over to this uh, this right side of the download page, pulled down the Helm chart, pulled it onto my Linux system. And then what you do is you just customize this values YAML file to match up with your environment. So the key points there, um, if you do have like namespace standards or, or what have you, where you don't want it to go into a default namespace, you can specify namespace here. Uh, it's definitely obligatory that you put in the appropriate ServiceNow instance that you're gonna target. And, and I mean, actually you don't have to, you can set up, specify these. That's the nice thing about, um, about Helm is you can also override these on the command line if you prefer. So you don't have to have a static values file if you want to work this into a, uh, you know, your cluster build um, CI CD pipeline, for example, you can, you know, plug it in with environment variables or, you know, override it on the command line. Um, and so we basically set a few basic parameters like the environment, the certificate purpose, uh, how long we want the certificate to be valid for. Uh, you can insert a certificate owner group and certificate owner if you want. And then you give it a time interval on, on which it um, will monitor the new certificate task table. I think by default, it's set to, I think, I think by default it wants to do 15 minutes. I just turned it up to one minute because I was specifically putting this together for a, a kind of a dynamic demo. I didn't want to be sitting around for 15 minutes waiting for the next step to kick in. Um, and then down at the bottom here, you plug in your private repository and then you can specify, you know, if you want to um, apply overrides to how often the image is pulled, uh, if there's specific tags to use, there's a place where you can put in um, image pull secrets, override the uh, name values resource, the rest of it's fairly standard. The, the main, you know, the, the main key things you definitely have to put in there are your instance name and your, your repo. And then I deployed that Helm chart to my cluster. And what I end up with is this pod running in the SN cert management namespace and it's named SN issuer controller manager. And then so there's a pre there is a prereq and we do those instructions are included here. Um, if you don't already have cert manager running in your cluster to support, you know, because like I said, it's kind of the standard when it comes to automated cert management within Kubernetes. So um, chances are you may already have this running in your environment, but if you don't, you do need there's uh, you know Helm charts and other I mean, pretty much. Um, you name it, there's probably uh, a payload to fit that kind of Kubernetes deployment facility to deploy cert manager. And so I've got my cert manager running and then I've got my external issuer running as well. So one of the things the Helm chart does is it populates the hooks so that cert manager knows that when it gets a certificate request, that calls back to this particular external issuer that it, you know, it knows, okay, that's where I need to send this particular certificate certificate request. Uh, just looking at the Q and A for a second. Um, okay. Johannes says hi to Kim. I guess that would have been, I'm going to have to check my settings and uh, the, I didn't purposely disable chat and it, it would have been 
useful to have chat enabled for that kind of friendly interaction. So I'm going to have to check that uh, for the following sessions. And um, let's see, Jack Har is asking, is there documentation stating the workflow flows within Service Now for Cert Manager? What is exactly is happening in the background? Um, I don't know. I, I let me. I'll make a note to see exactly how explicitly it's documented. Um, it is all executed via flows. So if you go to uh, if you go to Flow Designer, yeah, it's a good thing that this is all implemented with flows. It would have been a real pain to try and uh, work through my 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 setup um, my setup speed bumps on this Windows CA if I had to debug a bunch of JavaScript code directly. So if I filter out, just show the cert inventory management subflows. So they're all, it's all right here. So for example, for the Microsoft cert fulfillment, there's a subflow that kind of handles all of the operations. And then there are custom actions that are linked off of these subflows that you can kind of follow along and open the corresponding uh, custom actions within the flow. But then if I look at my executions, I can see, you know, I can see an execution for each of the requests that I ran through my test. And they're, um, especially since this, it's nice because with the Microsoft one, it uses PowerShell. So you can turn on PowerShell debugging at the platform level and then uh, can produce some very, um, very verbose output from the PowerShell command. Uh, there's actually, uh, um, uh, there is actually a knowledge KB that, let me just make a note. I'm going to include that in the links when I send out these slides, because there is a little bit of a quirk when it comes to enabling PowerShell debugging for flows where, um, there is kind of a special process for enabling that. And it's only something you're going to want to enable when you're debugging a particular issue because it actually, what it does is it inserts the verbose error output with the rest of the output of the PowerShell command, which will invariably break any PowerShell, um, any parsing that you have in your, in your PowerShell action where it's parsing the output. I discovered that uh, through this through this exercise, uh, PowerShell debug, maybe. Um, but I will check and see if there's any formal documentation. I, off the top of my head, I think I had to kind of dig into these flows on my own to kind of see what was going on, but they're not really obscured. They're all very kind of, um, you know, intuitively named and, and you can just look at exactly what they're doing either after the fact or ahead of time, if you want to kind of review it up front. Um, in theory, you could do a test run, although some of these, some of the inputs that it's expecting um, might not, um, might not be easy to kind of put together as a test payload. But other than that, it's uh perfectly it's a perfectly viable approach um so the rest of jayakar's question external issuer is sending tasks to instance on what basis is all calculation being done um it sends it it will base it on the spec that goes into the um that goes into your certificate request that goes into the cluster. So what I mean by that, is if I go over here, here's just a simple example certificate request for Kubernetes. So that the, you know, the scenario would be if you're running a pod that's 
provisioning a you know or me or orchestrating a web service and you want that web service to use TLS. This lets you automate the process of provisioning a certificate for that web service. Um, so what kind of determines that it gets sent to the service now external issuer is this issuer ref section here. And what that does is when the Helm chart provisions the external issuer, it applies a name and a group to it. And so it's similar to a, it's similar to like a selection criteria for running a pod. This has to match up and based on the name and group matching, cert manager will submit that request with the rest of the parameters, the subject, and in this case, the DNS names, the subject, uh, it sticks the common name in there, uh, the locality information, the corresponding email address duration, and the renewal window. And then the, you know, as we get to the kind of uh, functional demonstration, you'll see where it'll basically create a task within this new certificate task table. And then periodically monitor, you know, it basically makes an API call to submit the task and then it goes into a loop where it will monitor that task for status. And what I observed in my multiple failures that I incurred upon kind of learning how to do this is eventually it does detect a failure and eventually the external issuer will resubmit the certificate request. I didn't see, I'm not sure what the interval is on how often, it wasn't often enough for me to, uh, do meaningful testing. So I generally was just deleting the test cert request and, and resubmitting it to get it to, to redo. But there does appear to be some retry logic built in there. It does detect that the uh, if a task fails to uh, complete. Okay, so... Um, it was a good segue because the next step, once you've got all these pieces in place, is to attempt to request the certificate. So the way I'll do that is I'll just apply this simple manifest. So now if I, if I look, um, if I look at my cluster, So I'll see that there's a certificate record object named with the name matching what's in my uh, what's in my manifest. It'll show a ready status of false because it hasn't been provisioned yet. And it'll show the corresponding secret, which once the certificate does get created, that's where the certificate will end up residing. So now if I go to my ServiceNow instance and I look at my list of new certificate tasks. I can see there's a new task and the subject common name matches what I had in my example manifest. So um, in order for in order to do something with one of these tasks, you do need to create what's called a routing policy within the certificate inventory and management. Um, these can be either fully automated or include uh, you know, whatever kind of approval chain you want. So I set mine up to have an approval chain just so I could kind of validate everything and not spam my uh, my instance with a bunch of you know failing flows if I did have some kind of an issue. So um, since I was using a Microsoft CA, my, it uses PowerShell. So this is a PowerShell credential that I created, which can talk to, um, or it's a, yeah, it's a Windows, it's a Windows credential. Um, so that my mid server can communicate with my CA and make the 
required PowerShell commandlet calls. And then I defined this, um, here's my CA record that I created, just kind of a stub, just so that it recognizes the name. Whoops, never use the, never use the ServiceNow back button when you've got multiple tabs. I said you have to provide a, an approval group an assign or an assignment group for the uh, regard. Even if you're doing full uh, automation, it does need to have an assignment group for the routing policy. Here's where I identify the Windows certificate template. I just put together a, a quick test template for these requests feeding into the Windows CA. Here's where you specify the host IP for the Windows CA. Subject common name. Um, what else is pertinent? I did, you know, I've got multiple kind of different environment mid server set up. So I um, did specifically point it at my appropriate mid server. That's part of the Active Directory domain that the CA belongs in. You do have to assign a task approval group. This is pretty, this is just standard cert inventory and management. This is there's nothing unique here by virtue of the fact that these requests are coming in through cert manager from a Kubernetes cluster. So now that I've got that routing policy all set up, um, again, this is kind of, I went kind of semi-automated with this. So it does require approval, but then once it gets approval, then the rest of it's automated. But that's completely user configurable. And, and so these approvals have a special button called choose routing policy and approve. So because my routing policy um, You can you can align a routing policy so that the system just picks a routing policy based on the um, the certificate the values in the certificate request. So I I just didn't do that. I wanted to kind of keep it keep all the steps visible. But so this is not a necessary if full automation is desired. I just left it as a step along the way to allow me to kind of walk the narrative through. Cause honestly, if I didn't, it would be fulfilled before I had time to even describe what was going on. So now I'll apply the routing policy. And so now that task is approved. And if the if the gods of live demo are, are with me today, which they are, I now have a completed task with the uh, certificate attached. And if I go back to my cluster, uh, in practice, it does seem to take a minute or two for, so basically what happens is the task is completed, the collateral, the, the certificate itself. And I think this is, this would probably be the CA chain cert are attached. And then we have to wait for the external issuer to kind of loop back through, check the status of the task and feed it back to cert manager. Um, so generally that's going to be, you know, a, a couple of minutes. Uh, in the meanwhile, we can look at the execution um, let's see, that would be this one. So we can look at the execution of the flow and see all the steps that were performed. Fairly straightforward logic. It checks to see what type of request it is and then routes the logic accordingly. So here's the custom step to request renew a Microsoft cert. We can see the individual PowerShell steps executing. It, you know, it enumerates the output from each of them. So this was really handy when I was working through some kind of cred SSP 
um, access and authentication issues and that kind of stuff. Um, but the fact that it's implemented via subflows lends itself to, you know, debugging. I mean, even if, you know, there's a, a required requirement for customization, particularly to your environment. It's all kind of very uh, transparent and, and straightforward. So we're checking that we received the certificate with no error. Then we're looking up the cert management task, updating the cert management task. And then we're running this action to populate the certificate and attachments. There's some error handling down here, but we had no errors. So that was the end of the subflow. Let's take another look at the cluster. And so now we see that that certificate is listed as ready. And so if I go and look at this secret, now because that's the kind of the vehicle by which kubernetes services are able to retrieve and use that certificate and so here's my base 64 encoded certificate here's the the key and so it's basically, you know, standard format, consumable, ingestible by any number of services running within my Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, just going to the Q&A for a second. Um, that Jaikar again, that flows for the Microsoft CA, right? Not exactly for Kate Cert Manager. Do we have to make our own? Wasn't able to find. Well, so the Cert Manager piece, that is, you don't have to, that's not something you have to create. That's a, a standard Kubernetes. Um, and actually I'll make a note because I'll include the, um, actually that, link is probably here so if i go to the build instructions i think that talks about how to deploy a cert manager um, no i guess it doesn't it just talk just about listed it as a three rack installed yeah yeah, so cert manager by default, when you install it, right, there's capabilities inside of it for it to go and request new certificates. And by deploying this Helm chart for the <coughs> ServiceNow piece, <clears throat> um, it becomes a new issuer type that gets registered within the cluster. And then when you request a certificate with that issuer type, Cert manager knows to go and look for the service now issuer um, in order to issue that certificate. Yeah. So as far as the cert manager is concerned, you that's not something that you have to create. Um if it's not already in your environment, you would just hit certmanager.io and pull in whichever the, you know. Helm is is pretty popular. So there's a Helm chart for deploying cert manager. So it's as simple as just Helm install cert manager. And there's no additional coding or configuration required for that piece. And then, you know, like Mike said, the the Helm chart that deploys the external issuer for ServiceNow, again, just kind of sets all that up. So all you have to do to make sure that a certificate request gets routed to ServiceNow is when you put together a spec for a certificate within the Kubernetes cluster is that you craft this issuer ref 
with these values. That's that that's that's the extent of the, I would I would hesitate to even call it customization. It's really just uh, an aspect of the certificate request that just needs to be specified in that way in order to cause the <clears throat> cert manager to then pass the request to our external issuer, which then sends it into your ServiceNow instance. And and actually, Will, if I can steal the screen share for a second. Yeah. I have a <clears throat> diagram of the flow of how it works on the back Sweet. end. Nice. Within ServiceNow. Go right ahead. Um, let's see here. Let's. So effectively what this does, right? <clears throat> it creates the new certificate request. And then based on that, it determines whether or not it needs approval. Um, and if it is, it goes over and creates the automated task um, using these tables. <clears throat> and then there's a business rule here that's called out um, and a script include that's called out that, says, that looks at it and says, okay, does this match an existing routing policy? And if it does, then it triggers the routing policy um, and, and, and then gets the chain back and attaches it to the task and then and then pulls it back in from the CA and and drops it into the uh, the CI table. Um, if it can't figure it out, that's what Will was showing. It, it generates that approval record, which says, hey, not only do you need to approve this, but you also need to figure out what the routing policy is. Um, and then if you approve it and apply the routing policy, then it follows that same piece. Otherwise, if not, it just goes to the end and says, nope, I'm done, no thanks. So um, this is how all of the automated approvals, excuse me, all of the automated certificate management workflow works on the back end out of the box. It just so happens that this first step is being triggered by the Kubernetes certificate issuer that's been deployed in the cluster. And then the last piece is it picking it up from the ServiceNow instance off of that um, task and putting it back into the Kubernetes cluster as the resource that you requested it. Sorry, I'll stop sharing. Oh yeah, <clears throat> uh, it looks like uh, Johannes um, put his idea in there for the Vinafi. Um, it's in the uh, Q&A. So if everybody would go and upvote that to help out, that'd be great. Back you, Will. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, and then just to uh just to reiterate because it is kind of the important where that linkage takes place um this section here is what kind of routes that certificate request from your kubernetes cluster into your service now instance and then I didn't explicitly call it out. It is it is in the instructions for setting this up, that knowledge KB, uh, this knowledge KB here. Um, you basically create a Kubernetes secret, which um, is used by the, where you plug it. So you create a, you create a user that has these, um, these two standard cert management, excuse me, cert management roles on your instance. And then you create a Kubernetes secret that corresponds to that, which is used by the Helm chart to authenticate and make the API calls. And the instructions for that are in this KB, you can kind of see down here. 
it specifically gives you the the instructions. And then there's an example certificate request. This is probably what I use to generate mine. <clears throat> and again, that's kind of the key thing here. This is what sends it over to us as opposed to the standard kind of cert management um, that cert manager does out of the box. Any other questions? Okay. All right. I'm gonna say goodbye to uh, all our viewers out in YouTube land. Stop the recording. And so now we're at the part of the program where we just open it up for any kind of discussion. If anybody has any topics that they want to bring up um, for this month. The floor is open if anyone has any questions, topics, comments, etc. Going once. <clears throat> Good question so far today during the session. Appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. That's really what I think that's what kind of makes these webinars is the fact that people aren't shy about asking questions and um and providing feedback. Hopefully, you know, we can get some uh legs behind the idea of uh Vanafi integration. Yeah. Jack, are you, you got a question? Feel free yep. to come off mute. And... Yeah, here. Hi, Mike. Hi, Will. So it was an interesting session on the Kubernetes and cert management stuff. I'd like to share my understanding of this whole process of cert management. Sure. Mm -hmm. So... It all initiates from the discovery part. You get your discovery stuff done under the cert management. So certificates are discovered. Uh, by certificates, I mean Kubernetes certs. So once you have them on your unique search table or inside of ServiceNow, or then uh, you uh, you start this uh, cert manager. Uh, you you start using the cert manager, which is for automating the approval, which is renewing, revoking, or uh, doing stuff around, operational stuff around certificates, right? So I have a, a lot of questions related to the uh, internal processes of, of this Kubernetes cert manager in particular. So um, we have the certificates, so you said that uh, flows are for uh, Microsoft CA, not for the Kubernetes Cert Manager, which is quite understandable, I guess. So my question is, uh, how can we exactly uh, validate, first of all, this uh, Kubernetes? So after deploying external issuer and the Cert Manager, uh, we we tried using the, the demo file, which will, for obvious reasons, it, it won't work, right? So even if we, so suppose we have the YAML file with, with all the attributes and uh, we do the kubectl apply f with, with that file. So what does exactly kick in the backend that external issuer sends it and create to create a record in, in service now. On what basis is it going to get rejected or approved or failed? Oh, like what is happening? What is exactly happening in the backend? So is it is it supposed to be defined inside of the flows or is Well, what it... you should see is when you, if you submit a 
So if you submit a YAML file similar to, you know, similar to this example or the example that I used, yep. uh, what you should see on your cluster um, is first you should see you should see a certificate show up in a not ready state. That would show you that the cluster has ingested your request for a certificate. Um, then what you should see, the kind of the next step would be, you should see a task show up on your ServiceNow instance uh, under the new certificate task table, which corresponds to that common name that you put in your YAML file. If you don't, then you've got your, then you do have the ability to kind of potentially look at what's going on within, um, I guess I would start with the external issuer. So you could do, and you may need, um, you know, you may need to engage your, your Kubernetes admin team to do this piece. You can look on your cluster or they can look on, on the cluster and pull the logs. So this is just example of logs that are coming in from our external issuer. And this it, would show you- You're not sharing your screen if you're trying to show stuff. Oh. That's weird. Am I sharing screen one? I was sharing screen one. You would see, so I basically just to reiterate, I ran a logs command against our external issuer pod. And so this is just dumping out all of the logs um, when it stops. There we go. You can kind of see examples where it's saying, okay, I recognize somebody submitted, you know, cert manager has passed along a cert request to me. And so you would look, you know, presumably if you're not seeing a task show up on your service now instance, there would be an error indicating that there was some kind of a issue contacting the service now platform from the external issuer. Uh, if you don't see any indication here that, you know, that it's generating tasks or that it even received a request for a certificate, then you could have your Kubernetes team go and look at the cert uh the cert manager pods themselves uh and do the same kind of the same kind of thing pull the log from the cert manager pods uh, Sorry, copy paste error. So, you know, presumably if there's an issue submitting a certificate request to the external issuer, this pod log from cert manager would give you some kind of a, you know, some kind of an indication. But again, that would be, um, you know, if, if you're, uh, it's not unusual for ServiceNow platform admins, platform owners to not necessarily have full access to the Kubernetes clusters that they're discovering that they're supporting. So you may have to engage, you know, whatever team manages your Kubernetes clusters to get to this level of debugging. But really from a kind of a flow perspective, when it comes to provisioning or renewing certificates within a Kubernetes cluster, it doesn't become visible on the ServiceNow platform until the external issuer submits that standard new certificate task.
hopefully that helped clear it up at least somewhat. Uh, the other thing I would say is it's not required that you discover certificates before you try and use the provisioning capability. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt, but they're not kind of, uh, there, there isn't, uh, there isn't a hard and fast requirement. What will happen is if the cert already exists and it just requests it by virtue of going through this process, it'll get populated in the CMDB, but you can certainly, um, you know, if a cert already exists, then what I've seen, cause I've kind of repeated multiple cert requests without um, changing the, you know, changing the cert name. What I found was if it's already in the CMDB, it'll just send it right back immediately. It won't send it for new, um, you know, it won't need to submit it to the CA at all if it's already in the CMDB. So it's certainly useful to have discovered uh, as many of the search certs that exist in your environment as as you're able to so is it uh is it applicable to say that this is uh still not uh fully automated stuff and uh like like we, we're still manually executing that uh, command to to generate the certificate task and doing some um, stuff around it the level well what is fully automated is once once the certificate is requested within the cluster then it can be fully automated kicking off that you know submitting that yaml file the way i did um the only reason that was manual is for demonstration purposes if there's for example if there's a ci cd pipeline that is deploying this application to kubernetes part of that CI CD pipeline could be to submit that request, uh, submit, include the certificate as part of that YAML manifest that's getting, or Helm chart that's getting deployed to Kubernetes. In which case, once that certificate object appears, that's kind of, that's the trigger. So it's perfectly conceivable within a customer environment for the whole thing to be fully automated. It's not, um, but as far as what ServiceNow provides, ServiceNow provides everything after this initial certificate request is added to the cluster. So that piece could be automated, but that's there's no standard way to do that. Every customer is going to have a different, slightly different at least method for submitting cert requests into their environment, whether it's part of their CI CD pipeline. Potentially it could be part of the separate, you know, and there could be another customized service now workflow that's doing it. It all just depends on what your model is for deploying applications into your Kubernetes environments. I threw in the chat, uh, like a quick guide on cert manager. Um, and it gives a good, pretty good overview of kind of how it works. <clears throat> it's also important to note that cert manager will, issue requests for expiring certs too. So if you're using certificates that are signed within your cluster and they're coming up on their expiration date, cert manager will actually also do a certificate request resource to renew that certificate as well. And that whole process is, is fully automated um, and configurable. And, um, and then once it gets into the ServiceNow platform, you know, what, what we'll show today was kind of the a more manual flow requiring approval. Um, but you can certainly build out a routing policy within ServiceNow that um, does not require any approval or any human intervention whatsoever. Um, it, that's certainly possible. Um, that just wasn't part of the demonstration today. Yeah, that's a good call out, Mike. That's one of the benefits of CERT Manager is once you've got a CERT in your system within your Kubernetes cluster, it keeps track of them. And when they're about to expire, it'll automatically reprovision and, and renew them. Yeah, so it 
but it did give a quite insight, quite a lot of insight into, into the process. I'm still having a lot of questions. So do we have a capability or resources to take it up or? Yeah, I would say start with your, um, start with your ServiceNow account team. Um, there are, there's going to be some links in the, when I send out the slides, there's some links. Um, there are a couple KBs about the external issuer. Um, but I would say, um, on top of that, leverage your ServiceNow account team. They can get kind of backend resources within ServiceNow and put you in touch with them to kind of look into your specific environment, give you recommendations and um, kind of, you know, at least give you some, some guidance on where to, you know, on, on where to go from here. Um, and then, yeah, th those are kind of the, uh, uh, well, and then the other thing is a lot of customers are leveraging, you know, partners. So certainly, um, you know, if, if you happen to be using a partner for any part of your kind of managing your, your instances, your platforms, they're definitely a resource to tap into as well. But yeah, I mean, that generally the go-to is, um, you know, talk to your account team. I basically, to put this together, I kind of reached back to the product team to get some collateral and some um, some of the initial kind of transfer of information content that was put together. So I would say if you, you know, talk to your, talk to your ServiceNow account team, they should have access to at least that same kind of stuff that they can um, provide to you. Sorry, I had to step away for a second. Did we? Did we? Answer? I was just, uh, I was just saying, definitely leverage, oh, yeah. leverage the, that service now account team to when you you need more, kind of either internal resources or just more kind of detailed information about really any of the platform capabilities. Yep. Did we dive into, um, the question in the Q and A right now? Oh no! Thank you for. Uh, building service maps is to Durga wants to know if we covered building service maps from Istio using CNO in any of our previous webinars. Um, we may have touched on it in one of the, cause we've done a couple CNO sessions. Um, but I don't know. Do you, do you guys have a lot of Istio? within your clusters, Durga? Uh, yes, Mike, we are planning to have the Istio based service mesh uh, controller um, in um, EKS. So we just want to understand, we, we, we took your help. I really appreciate your help in you know, operationalizing of our CNO for visibility purpose. So mm -hmm. we like the feature. Um, and now we the next logical uh, strategic point is to build the service maps using uh, Istio service maps. So that's the reason the background of that question was, you know, was there any webinar or any kind of a session we did in the previous base with engineers? I, uh, I don't think I, I, we probably touched on it, but I don't think we went super deep. Yeah. Let, I just made a note. I'm going to follow up on that because I haven't seen it explicitly spelled out roadmap wise, but I'm not sure what the longevity is going to be for Istio just because it didn't seem to really get a lot of adoption within the customer base. And due to the, um, the challenges with maintaining um, container images right now, the strategic direction for CNO, it's funny, you should kind of bring this up because I just, um, We've got a new uh, lightweight, publicly available CNO container image coming out with a November store release that um, 
is kind of going the other other direction where it's going very lightweight and coupled with the fact that we released the open telemetry um service graph connector which does a lot to generate service maps based on services talking to each other within the cluster um there's a, you know i i don't want to i don't want to uh be, yeah. be too much into it but it, it does seem like it's at least worth asking the question whether what the future is for the istio piece of the functionality because it definitely hasn't come up lately internally so i don't in know the, in the cno product uh, um, information page they specifically called out that um, they can we in through cno we can by importing um, service mesh data Yes, build the that, service maps. I want to understand yeah. if that anywhere realized or what is the, uh, is there any uh, set of instructions or anywhere guide or somewhere so that we just want to do a POC and yeah. see what kind of data it can reveal so we yeah. can take it operationalization. I I did it um, when did. it first went GA, and um. I'll I'll kind of go through my notes to get the specifics, but what my just off the top of my head, what I recall was um you put you put Istio in the cluster, you tie it into Prometheus, and then you include when you discover your cluster, you include the Prometheus URL yep. in the mm -hmm. pattern, um, in the in the pattern parameters. And then when you do that, it pulls in the network flows that Istio is recording. Correct. And um, one of the things that I ran into was that Istio was not <laughs> properly reporting into Prometheus. So I was running into issues getting that flow data in where I needed it to be able to build those service maps. So that's um, that was a configuration issue on my end, right? Um, but something to be aware of is that because it, it actually pulls that flow data from Prometheus, um, you, you have to have that Prometheus report, Istio reporting into Prometheus appropriately in order for that to work right. Yeah, I had the same issue with my, because I started out, I had kind of like an all-purpose Prometheus instance within my Kubernetes cluster. Yep. And that wasn't seeing anything. And so just to kind of make it work, I think I ended up using Istio CTL to install the Istio specific Prometheus plugin or, or yep. deployment. Mm -hmm. And and it worked in that very kind of specific targeted um, deployment. I'm sure there's a way to make Istio talk to a more kind of cluster wide Prometheus um, facility, but I was just kind of doing some quick and dirty experimentation. So I didn't kind of follow that to its logical conclusion once I got it, once I got it working in some fashion, but um yeah, I think I've got some notes on it or you know, I'll, I'll kind of go back and 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 see what um what I can retrieve from when I was when I was looking at that. It wasn't that that was the only that's the only kind of hiccup that I can recall other than that. I was mainly um I was leveraging the Istio CTL utility to kind of configure all the Istio stuff within within my one cluster so i didn't have to you know dig in and, and individually manipulate different uh different components too much but um that's 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 what i remember i'll, I'll follow up and include uh what my findings when we send out our our wrap-up emails thank you will that sure. i appreciate that Sounds good. Good stuff. Okay. Q and A is empty. Does anybody have anything else? Okay. All right. Well, thank you as always, everybody, for the the engagement and the the lively uh, 
the lively conversation. Mike, thanks for braving not feeling well. No worries. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, looking forward to next week when I feel better. Yes. <laughs> All right. So our next session's uh, mid-November-ish, the 16th. Yep. We're going to be at KubeCon like about a week before that. So if we don't see any of you at KubeCon in Chicago, uh, hopefully we'll we'll see you next month, uh, later in the month at the uh, the next webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mike. Thank Take you, care, guys. Feel Take better, care. Mike.